that we're in. Sorry about uh, that. So Dr. Levy, um, you guys may, he spoke at the conference actually. I, I was at the conference, it was great. Right. Mm -hmm. As an epidemic is a great starter place and we give it to all of our new patients. Mm -hmm. A lot about this connection. Um, that's a great one. When we go, just review a few of these things real quick will be helpful. Uh, hey, before before we go too far, um, the sound quality is coming through pretty poorly with Dr. Chandler, and and what he's saying is important. So I'm hoping we can get a good clear recording of this. Let's see, does that help if I turn my speaker up any? Uh, a, I think a it's about the same. Yeah, maybe a little. I'll try to speak that's up. What we got. That's that what we got. Um, I'll try to speak up a little bit and see if that helps clear things up. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Picture of a cavitation. It's a lower jawbone in a patient, wisdom tooth area. It's basically just a rotten spot inside the bone. Um, but what's unique about these is they don't trigger some of the inflammatory markers that you would normally look for. Um, but Others like this Rantes is there's been over 60,000 papers and studies have been done on this in the last few years. They've linked the just about every cancer, autoimmune disorder. Um, Dr. Lechner's work will really point you a good direction on that. The average for bone normally is 150, and you can you can test it with an ELISA test. They say I haven't figured out how to do that yet, but um, the average for cavitation sites is over 5,000. That's a more than a 30 fold increase in this inflammatory protein that they directly link to all kinds of, you know, every, everything else that's wrong with people. Um, and it's on the heart meridian. And so it blocks the meridian, the energy flow. So the heart doesn't have as much energy to fight back. Um, the bacteria that are in these is another big factor. And what Dr. Levy talked about recently in our meeting is that that bacteria eats away the myelin sheath of the mandibular nerve, which is responsible for a major portion of your brain activity, and it exposes bare fibers. So you get these trigeminal neuralgia or these atypical facial pains that people have, and a lot of times they can be caused by a cavitation. But the unique thing that I just learned from him is that when it demyelinates this nerve, it triggers demyelination of the nerves in other areas of the body. So some of these fibromyalgia type patients, um, these distal pains that you don't know where they're coming from, could link back to these cavitation sites between the inflammation and the demyelination of the nerve. So that was some new information for me. Um, I'll show you two. We just uh, got a, a here's a, a DNA test that we do. Um, pretty routinely of when we extract a root canal tooth, for example, or clean out these cavitations. A lot of times we'll send this to the lab and say, hey, what was in this? And this one had 27 different strains of bacteria, most of them in the red. Um, there's some pretty nasty stuff involved in these. So, okay, go back. So we talked about a lot of that stuff last time for those who were um, with us. So that was just kind of a brief review of what we look for. The best way to find those things is on a cone beam scan, a 3D x-ray. Um, this is an example of, of what it looks like. This is kind of the Halloween picture where it takes all of the flesh off and just shows us bone. And what we can see on this is, for example, in this upper wisdom tooth area, Turn it so we can see. It looks like just a big hole, like Pac-Man just took a big bite out of this, and there's just some little flakes of bone in there. Well, that bone's actually there. It's just so soft, the computer doesn't think it's bone. So when we look at the actual x-ray version here, we'll go to this area. And this patient has a big sinus infection. We find those all the time. But down in this bottom right-hand corner are bone density readings. And we see, let's go to this lower one. These dark spots are where we don't see all the good um, bone inside. And we see those bone density readings go into the negatives. So this one's over 300, negative 300. So that is a big cavitation on this young girl. All kinds of autoimmune disorders, 
um, major digestive issues. She's been pretty miserable for a long time. And these are the type of things that we typically see clear up after cleaning out cavitations. So these upstream hidden infections can be the cause of a lot of these patients that just are refractory. They just don't get well when they should be. Jump back into, so we talked about a lot of that stuff last time. This time I wanted to go into a little bit more about kind of the future of biological dentistry. Where, where do we go from here? Um, analyze the pictures here. Get this guy out of the way and start this. So some of the challenges I see in biological dentistry today is that there isn't like a, a per se training program. You don't learn about it in dental school. They don't talk about cavitations. In some places like Canada, if you even mention the word cavitation, the board of dentistry is all over you. Um, so they have to be really careful what they say on, you know, about these things. Um, biological dentists are always going to keep our heads down, a lot like probably what you guys have seen in your career. Um, where a dentist can begin to learn, um, I had the good luck of running into Dr. Mark Lafferty, I think spoke to you guys recently. Um, when I first moved to Utah and he said, if you'll learn this stuff, I'll send you lots of patients. And I said, that sounds like a good business decision. So I started learning it and found out that I just loved it. It was amazing stuff. And that's how I got started in biological dentistry over 10 years ago. There are some organizations, the IOMT is a good one, um, that are dentists, physicians, university researchers, uh, kind of the whole gamut where we all meet together. Uh, the Holistic Dental Association, the IABDM is another one. These are places that a new dentist that's interested in this can go to start to learn about biological dentistry. So there are some resources, but there's not a standard. And what we find is as dentists start learning these things, um, they may really get into the mercury removal. And for the first several years, I did the mercury removal and that type of thing, but I didn't even know much about cavitations. I didn't do cavitation surgery. Um, so it's usually kind of a process as you learn and grow through this. And the, the best way for most dentists doing this is to, to find a mentor. Um, I was able to go to Switzerland to the Swiss Dental Solutions Clinic. Um, he was the inventor of the zirconia ceramic dental implants. Um, great program there. Uh, Dr. Klinghart was, was teaching over there. and was able to, to get some good information from there, but it, they're kind of few and far between. Um, there's a few dentists, there's one here in Utah that teaches programs to dentists throughout the year of learning these things. Um, but there's so many aspects to biological dentistry, so many layers that it can be a hard process. And patients a lot of times don't know the difference. And so they can be going to a biological dentist who says, I don't see any cavitations on your x-ray. And we get this every week. Someone will send us an x-ray. Their biological dentist told them they had no cavitations. But this dentist doesn't do cavitations, doesn't know that much about them like I used to be. And they don't have the right software in their x-ray process to be able to analyze the bone densities to see where they're at. And so that's one of the, the biggest obstacles, I think, to new dentists or to patients is finding a biological dentist who knows enough and does everything. There's a lot of different areas of biological dentistry. We talked a little bit about the mercury removal, doing that safely so you don't completely toxify your patient by trying to make them better. I've seen so many patients over the years that read that the mercury was bad and they went in and had all their fillings taken out and they swallowed gallons of it and it's all over in their system and now they're sick and they can't get rid of it. And so it's important that you go to someone that's been trained that knows how to do that safely. Um, biomimetic dentistry is a close cousin and many biological dentists practice this form of dentistry. Um, and this is where they do, instead of crowns and things, they do many layers of fillings that tries to match how the tooth naturally works. And there's some pros and cons to that. Um, ozone can be a really helpful aspect. Um, I'm sure some of you guys have used ozone a lot in the past. Um, that can be great, but for cavitations, it doesn't seem to work. 
I've had a lot of patients that have been to a dentist sometimes for months in a row having ozone injections over and over and over again, and it never cures their cavitations at all. And so we found that to not be completely effective. Um, zirconia implants and removing titanium ones. There's few things as bad for patients as a titanium dental implant. It's a great antenna for your cell phone, but it is not good for the health of the patient. And suddenly we are seeing 10 million titanium implants that are failing in patients that have been serviceable for years, sometimes decades. And what we think the difference is, is now with these 4G and 5G cell phones that you're holding right up next to them, these implants actually heat up about five degrees Celsius and they cook the bone. They're migrating titanium particles out into the body. We're starting to see a much higher incidence of titanium allergies. Um, where it used to be hardly anyone was allergic to it. But because it's in the mouth and the way the meridian system works, the teeth are like the circuit breakers for the rest of the body, that having that huge interference field that a lot of times is on a molar, it's on a digestion, a stomach or a large intestine, it can be a major obstacle to your patients getting well. They're not fun to take out. Um, they can be pretty challenging to take out sometimes, but we've seen so many patients finally get well once we get the titanium out. Um, knowing how to take out root canals properly, cleaning out the bone all around, cleaning out the cavitation bone that forms around the root canals, um, doing the cavitation surgery properly. There's a huge difference in protocols among biological dentists of how they do cavitation surgery. A lot of them are still doing them with a dental drill. They drill through the bone with the dental drill, which makes a lot of heat and heat kills bone, and sometimes that can be an obstacle to healing. Um, what you clean the cavitation out with, we use um, a laser, a cold laser, and then we do ozone, then we do the platelet-rich fibrin, we do homeopathics, we're starting to add irrigating with, with a silver, um, a colloidal silver, or a nano silver that comes from Canada. Um, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit more um, here in a little while. Um, Another aspect of biological dentistry is airway and sleep disordered breathing. This can be a major issue for patients' health. Um, using these lasers, there's some treatments that we can do that shrinks the soft palate, that shrinks the tonsillar pillars, that opens up more airway to help these patients breathe better. But there's lots of different ways of doing that that dentists can learn and some work better than others. Um, there are some new orthodontic appliances like Invisalign that are doing a pretty good job of opening up the arch and allowing more airway. Uh, laser dentistry, lots of, I, I think it's critical for biological dentistry that the dentist is using a laser. Now there's every spectrum of lasers down from really cheap ones that only do like cutting gums to ones that detoxify and, and clean out inside the bone. There's even been some pretty good work done using lasers for root canals to disinfect the tooth with a laser, they're showing much better promise than the previous ones. I think they're still risky and the jury's out on that, but um, there is some improvement there. Um, Platelet rich fiber. It, a lot of people know what PRP is and a lot of physicians have used PRP for joints and for all kinds of different things. But PRF is like platelet rich fiber and is about 20 times more effective. Um, it's much less expensive. It doesn't involve any anticoagulants like the PRP does. Um, it, it's better for the patient. It works better. And, but as it's progressed, there's many different systems and protocols for using the PRP that can have a dramatic difference in the patient's healing. So for a biological dentist to learn these things and know the difference, it can be kind of daunting. Um, now, getting into supplements and, and the huge difference that it can make when you properly supplement your patient. So most of our patients are working with a good functional medicine doctor, and we're able to coordinate with them to get the patient on uh, enough D3, for example, and, and supplements that help with their healing. Um, homeopathies, we use a lot of homeopathies. We, when we do these big surgeries and clean out cavitations, most of the time we'll do an IDC infusion. Um, with other um, nutrients in it as well. Uh, that can really help with the healing. There's a lymphatic machine, Flopresso, that we've started using that really keeps their lymphatics moving so they don't swell and hold all the fluid in their face. 
Um, and then this nano silver, this Canadian Verisil actually has FDA approval for treatment of all aspects of surgery, of dentistry, cleaning out fillings. We can use it in the bone. We can use it in our IV lines. We can use it in our laser fluids. Um, just about everything. Um, there's there's been work done on, and he's managed to get approval both in Canada and the U.S. Um, that's something that we've been a little hesitant to use in the past. And all of the ones, even the good ones like our Jetin 23, and those have are approved for cosmetic use only. They're not approved inside the bone for surgery. And if something happens, then we could be in trouble. So these are, are some of the layers that a biological dentist needs to learn. And most of them are somewhere in that process of, of learning those. Um, technology is the other big thing. Um, I mentioned lasers. For us, the laser is critical. We use it on almost every patient. It has a biostimulation laser that's a hot laser, an NDEI, and then that's 900 and some nanometers. And then the cold laser that we use in surgery is over 2000, it's like 2300, 2800, something like that. Um, these are critical, but it can be a major barrier to treatment, especially for a dentist just getting into this because the laser itself is $100,000. The cone beam CT scan, you can find some smaller ones that do smaller pictures and, and kind of some you know, lesser known companies for less. But for example, the one that we use that will do the whole head and has the best pictures, $130,000. So you can see where that can be a huge barrier sometimes for doing the best possible biological dentistry. Then the learning curve. These are difficult surgeries, uh, removing the root canal teeth and immediately placing implants the same day is, is an acquired skill that most dentists don't have. Um, the manufacturer hype of, of lasers, and you guys have, have seen that. All these new things that come out, how much is real and how much is hype. Um, the ozone, huge range of application for ozone and how to use it and what you can do with it. and being trained enough to get the most out of your ozone. Now there's a new ultrasound unit called the Cavitao that is coming from Germany from Dr. Lechner where they use ultrasound and the ultrasound readings will show you where the soft spots in the bone are. Um, we don't have that available yet, but they keep telling us soon. Um, microcurrent, um, we've had some really good luck with pain patients and things like that using microcurrent. We like this Zavazio machine. Um, T-scan is a computerized bite equilibration that is great for treating TMJ and migraines and all kinds of things like that. But again, huge learning curve and expensive equipment. Um, learning and being certified and not getting in trouble with state boards and things like that, doing IV nutrient therapy. Um, I mentioned the Flopresso lymphatic treatment. Um, pretty new to dentistry or digital scanners and 3D printing. There's a lot we can do with those with our bone grafts and, and implant planning and things like that. But again, it can be a huge barrier for dentists getting into that. And for physicians that are referring is knowing what's available and, and what might be possible for your patients. Um, I mentioned the, the platelet-rich fiber, which tubes to use, which centrifuges. Now we found that a horizontal centrifuge does the best. The, the tubes need to spin horizontally to get the best platelet-rich fiber. Um, a, a big new thing that we're starting to see more of in dentistry is doing facial aesthetics. And I think there may be some of you guys, actually, I think um, Bill may even do some, Jim told me, the uh, facial aesthetics. But we do that with the lasers and the PRF instead of some of these fillers and things like that that might be more toxic to patients. Um, insurance can be a big barrier. We know that Many of these procedures that we're doing, there are no dental codes for, and the, it's hard to find the right medical codes to work. And so most of the time we don't mess with it. But there are some companies out there that are starting to do medical billing for dentists, especially like through Medicare and things, where they will cover things like infections and bone grafts to rebuild bone. And so trying to negotiate and navigate that field to help 
patients be able to get some coverage through medical insurance is another aspect of this that can be a huge barrier to patients getting treatment. Um, how do we move ahead in the future? As biological dentists, um, the, the best thing that I found uh, and most new dentists that want to start getting into this just have this fear that as soon as they start going down this natural road, all their patients are going to leave. And what most of them find out if they actually bite the bullet and do it is that their patients don't leave, they actually get more and more patients and the patients appreciate you more. And instead of being the, you know, I hate to see you, that I hate going to the dentist, you get patients that come in that are so happy to be here and love to see you because they leave feeling better. Um, so that can be, you know, a, a big thing that once dentists take the plunge and start learning this and for you guys as refers, talking to your dentist, whoever you're using, and trying to get them like Mark Lafferty did to me years ago, and get me into this line of work, that we're starting to see some increase in, in dentists that are wanting to learn this stuff, and that's great, but um, getting through that process can be a little daunting. Um, getting out of our box and losing the, the fear, you know, of doing something different. So that can be challenging. It's also hard sometimes to not overpromise the patients. We've seen patients everywhere from cancer patients that call back a few weeks after surgery, taking out all the root canals and cleaning out their cavitations. And they call back within weeks and say their tumors are shrinking or their cancer's gone or their 20 year Hashimoto's is completely gone. They're off all their medications. Um, we see enough of those that it's hard for us sometimes to not overpromise to our patients, hey, this is going to cure all that ails you and, and have so much enthusiasm about what we're doing. Um, but it's just part of the bigger picture. And there's so much detox and follow up that needs to happen with their physician after we're done. Um, but finding and cleaning out these upstream infections can be huge. Um, and, and, you know, along that aspect, working as a team with the functional medicine, nutrition, detox specialist, um, energy medicine, like we, I've had a couple of patients this last year that just did not respond like others and things weren't healing well and they didn't feel good and they had pain where most of our patients don't. And we just couldn't find any physical reason for it. And I would send them to somebody to get some energy work done on a little different aspect of things. And within a week, they come in and they're a totally different person and their healing is totally changed. And so not overlooking some of those kind of out of the box pictures and, and being able to refer patients when needed to those kind of things. Um, now, uh, I want to jump back in a little bit more about the, the cavitations. The official term is FDOJ. It's a um, chronic inflammation in the jawbone, degenerative softening and osteolysis, osteonecrosis of the jawbone, um, adipocytes. What they look like, um, jump out here and, and show you and how soft the bone is. But the, some of the acute cytokines like TNF alpha just don't show up. And so you don't see those, but then you get this huge amount of this Rantes pro-inflammatory proteins and things that just that are causing all kinds of issues. Um, I had some great pictures here. Let's see if I can find one. This is what comes out of a cavitation site. So this is during surgery. We've opened up the bone and these huge drops of yellow oil are what's draining out of this patient's jawbone. So this melted bone marrow and bacteria and junk is, is what we find in these jaw bones. Now they don't all look this bad. This was an extra good one. Um, but it looks like butter that's been in the microwave is, is basically the, the best way of explaining that. Um, and I showed you the, the bacteria test on that. Um, let me see, my daughter is gonna put some pictures in here for me. Well, actually, there's some here in, in Dr. Lechner's lecture. Let me show you this one. And it, it, 
if you want to ever talk to Dr. Lechner, he's in Germany. Like I said, he's written several books and a ton of articles on this stuff. Um, this is, is what this junk looks like before it turns into that oil. It's like jello that's in these cavitation sites. This is the Rantes protein, the pro-inflammatory protein. But we see on this um, x-ray here, you can see the tooth. This is the wisdom tooth area that a lot of times this infection will spread through the jawbone. And these cavitations don't always just stay locally right in that site. And I, I've got a patient that's been hospitalized like four times now with sepsis and they cannot find anything the matter with her. We go in and find that she's got this infection that has spread virtually through almost her entire jawbone. Um, these are the kind of out of the box cases that you see sometimes with this. Um, jump out of that. Yeah. He sent me one specifically for, should give me one second to grab this one for you guys, some work that he had done. Not that one. Going to move this. So on um, this one, get that book out of the way. Dr. Lechner did this um, paper that he said I could share with you about rheumatic complaints and how this chemokine rantes has this link um, and he's got a, a free download with it that you can look at that. This shows a picture of the Cavital, this ultrasound unit and how that works. But these are the pictures that I wanted to show you in these areas in the bone, when we open up the bone and take out this top layer of bone, it is just like all of this oily junk and dead bone is what's in there. It eats away the jawbone and just leaves these little lacy pieces of bone left. Um, sorry, they're kind of nasty looking pictures, but all of, again, all this just fatty degenerative osteolysis of the jawbone is, is what we're looking at. So this is the kind of stuff that we're that we're cleaning off. Um, we'll jump back here. Um, he did he did put some YouTube videos that you know I'll share this with you. You guys can look at those, showing some surgeries, how we go in and clean them out, and that sort of thing um, that are helpful and. And then I put those, that paper that I just showed you is right here. So there's, there's the download. Um, here's a link to his new book, Cash, Cavitational Osteonecrosis in the Jawbone. Um, I highly recommend it. You guys can get a, a lot of good information about this and about what's really going on and how this one little factor may be what's keeping some of your patients from getting well. So that's it. Let me open you back up here and I want to try to leave some time today for any questions that anybody may have. There we go. So <clears throat> um, can first question is can cavitations be seen on MRIs? Not that I'm aware of. The only two ways that I know that we can see them diagnostically is with the cone beam scan that has bone density readings. And you can see them sometimes just visually and see that they're there. But to mm -hmm. quantitatively say, yeah, this is negative 500 on the Hounsfield units instead of a positive 500 value. Um, 
not that I know of, but I haven't I haven't tried. It. And, um, and then the ultrasound is cat by cat. Can Varicil be infused as an IV? Yes, that's one of the things um, that we can do. You can actually do quite a bit through the IV. So I just barely uh, hooked up with, with Andrew Willoughby, the uh, dentist <laughs> in Canada. And anybody that's interested in talking to him, he'd love to share whatever he has. Um, we can help you get signed up to be able to buy this. And what it gives us that we've not had before is a layer of protection against mm -hmm. many state boards and things like that, that we're using some of these alternative therapies with patients. Um, the other thing that his program has given is that where, where it's still research, it's not settled in the field of dentistry using silver by any means, that we're able to dial in protocols and, and test it with the PRF and do things like that as, as a research basis. And if there are some great tax provisions um, for research where we could get huge amounts of tax credits back for doing this research using the silver and all of our protocols. Um, so that can be very helpful as well. And it's been fully vetted through the IRS as well as the Canadian authorities. Um, in Canada, you have to get pre-approved before you start doing the, the research. In the US, you don't. <laughs> Besides cavitation surgery, are there any other options for treatment? Yes and no. The, the most effective for sure is, is to do the cavitation, is to do the surgery. Get right in there, clean all the junk out. Now, that being said, I've done probably four or 500 cases over the last several years where we just use the biostimulation laser. It penetrates really deep into the bone. It'll kill some of the bacteria and it opens up circulation. Our biggest problem with cavitations is that it, the, the blood flow stops, which is a good thing because less of the bacteria gets out. But if we can get some circulation moving to bring in healing factors and to start to grow new bone, and we've had some limited success using the biostimulation laser at some pretty high settings, um, people feel better. They notice a difference. Um, long term, is it going to hold up? I don't know. On the bigger ones, for sure, it's not a great option. Um, there are quite a few dentists doing the ozone and some claim success with it. Um, I've not seen that be the, the case. They'll do an X tip where they drill a little hole in the bone sometimes even and they'll get the ozone right inside the bone. Um, it can be incredibly painful. And I've seen several times where patients, it flares up everything. It's like it just opens a can of worms and everything goes crazy. Um, but some dentists claim that they've seen a lot of success with it. It just hasn't been my experience. Uh, what IVs do you see that helps with dental surgery? Uh, C, obviously, the, the C is the biggest one. And, you know, again, to be careful with what we do, I don't, I'm not a physician. We don't have, you know, HPD clearances and things on, on patients a lot of times. So we don't usually do higher than 25 grams. Um, but that can be hugely effective. So we don't do real high dose. Um, we do add the B vitamins. We do the glutathione push at the end. Um, several other nutrients as well um, that, that seem to be helpful just to support the patient overall. If we can do an IV during the surgery and then another one a week later, do the lymphatic treatments in the meantime, that's when we get the best results. Can amalgams leach when we eat hot, warm, or, or warm drinks or when you'll bite using them? Yes, especially. And they're always leaching. They never stop. But a few things really flare them up and just cause them to just go crazy. Um, mm. Hot drinks, acidic foods, tomato and that type of things can really set them off. Uh, teeth grinding. People that grind their teeth in their sleep. If they have sleep apnea or sleep issues, a lot of times they'll really grind their teeth. That triggers a lot of amalgam to be released out of these things. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, all those kind of things will, will cause an extra increase in the amalgam release. Some of the newer amalgam fillings that have been released in the last decade or so, um, instead of improving things, they're better for dentists. They set up faster, they're stronger, so they don't break as easy. Like they've got some properties that way. But the new ones 
release about 40% more mercury in the first three or four months than any of the old ones have in the past. Okay. Is, Veri is Vericil better than Argentin? Dr. Willoughby claims yes. He's got 50,000 documented cases and full FDA approval. Um, a lot of his literature says, says yes. Now I've used Argentin for years and we've loved it, but it is only approved for cosmetic purposes. If I use it in surgery inside the bone and a patient has some kind of weird thing happen, um, that could be a little iffy for me. And so that's where this Vericil gives us another layer of protection. Uh, are there issues with cavitations with dental implants? Yes. Um, let me actually show you a picture of one here on, on Dr. Lechner's paper. Two reasons. One is because most of the time the implants put in to replace a root canal tooth that was extracted. All these root canal teeth are leaching massive bacteria. Um, we've seen as, as high as 45 different strains of bacteria in root canal teeth. Our average is over 20. Um, some of that is usually left in the bone if it's not lasered and ozoned and all of these things to clean it out. But Dr. Lechner's done some work as well and shown that the titanium itself tends to cause an increase in, in the mercury in the cavitations around the implants. So this with the titanium, I should say. Um, I've got a picture of one here. So here's a picture of a titanium implant, this yellow oily bone, you can see the drops of oil in the flash of the camera. This is pretty typical around implants. Um, it's pretty rare that I take out a titanium implant that I don't get a big discharge of, of the cavitation oil around it. So that does seem to be a factor. Um, who should we contact for Vericil and do you have any contact info? Um, I'll, I'll send it to you so you can send it out to everyone. His name's Andrew okay. Willoughby, he's a, a dentist in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Great product and just a ton of research behind it. And like I said, with FDA approvals to use in surgery, IVs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's something that we've not had available to my knowledge. Okay. I'm not sure if I understand this next question, but if a root canal is seen under cone beam to not have infections, is it okay to stay in? No. Um, you know, I, I do muscle testing and things, and I test about one out of 500 that tests strong. Um, mm -hmm. Now, that being said, they're all bad. There's no such thing as a clean root canal. Um, we test them all the time, and a lot of times the ones we test have, have no signs of infection on the x-ray. They look great. We take them out, we send them in and have them tested, and they come back with 20 different bacteria that are all in the red zone, that are off the charts. Um, it's impossible the way a tooth is, is like, has one main canal or two or three or four, depending on the tooth, but then it has literally miles of little dental tubules, tiny little canals all through the tooth. We do not have a, a technique that's possible to clean those out. Now with the laser and with a new rinsing technique that a lot of endodontists are using called Gentle Wave, it's dramatically improved, but they always leach. And the interesting Thing about root canals and be, because it's in the mouth and, and the way you chew, it is a perfect delivery system that it sends all of that bacteria and those factors, not just into the bloodstream, but into the lymphatics as well. And that's why there's such a huge connection to the breast cancers is because it just goes right down through the face, through the lymphatics. And we see a lot of that issues with the breast cancer. I saw one yesterday from England. Um, Dr. Levy explains that, that it, he thinks it's more effective than starting an IV of bacteria and running it into the system because you're also hitting the lymphatics when you're chewing on these things. So uh, most of us will tell you that no, there's not, no such thing as a, as a clean root canal. Um, however, you see one that's got a big infection and it's eating a hole into the sinus, then we are more concerned about it. But we generally recommend that people have them all removed. 
can laser be is be beneficial on its own yes yeah we use laser for all kinds of things for biostimulation for healing for um we always treat the tonsils when we do these surgeries and um tonsil stones and all kinds of things that all this stuff has been draining into these tonsils all these years that either a procaine injection or using the laser a couple of times on the tonsils and we see a huge difference in swelling in um, how fast the patients heal how well they do and so i, I think leaving the tonsils unaddressed is, is a big problem that most biological dentists have um, sending them back to you guys to get that done or something. The tonsils need to be addressed when these kind of, this kind of work is done in the mouth. Um, I'm not sure exactly what this is. I might have to interpret it. When a dentist says they can remove mercury, can we take their word for it or do they need to see a certification? I'm not sure what that yeah. is. There, is there some sort of a certifying board or some sort of curriculum that needs to be kind of. covered. Uh, the SMART program. Um, let's see on this first one. Go up here. So the IAOMT has a program they call the SMART protocol, where a dentist can go to a couple of days of class. They learn about cavitations and they learn about how to safely take out mercury. Um, having that certification is a good sign that they've at least been trained in it. Now a lot of us. Guys have been doing this for a long time, didn't go through the extra couple of days of training and get the certification just to show that we have it. We're already doing all the stuff that they teach anyway. So I, for example, don't have that certification, but I'm doing the protocols and, and the SMART protocols. Um, so you just have to ask some questions and, and see, but you can, on the IOMT website, it talks about it. You can see what aspects there are to it and kind of know what questions to ask. They also have a link to dentists that are in the group. Um, and that can be a little iffy as well, because some dentists will go to one meeting, find out about it, and be listed in the list. And, and so generally finding someone that's been to more meetings, that type of thing, go to their website, see what kind of stuff they're talking about. Um, you got to do a little bit more homework. But that's a good place to start. Are there choices for ceramic implants? And if there are, how do you choose? Uh, there are, um, there are several companies out now making ceramic implants. Most of the big titanium companies are all have or are coming out with ceramic implants, um, because that's where the market's going. That's what the patients are asking for. There are more and more oral surgeons and dentists that are starting to do a few here and there, just when somebody requests it, um, there can be a huge difference in the implants themselves. Um, the ones we use, the SDS implants from Switzerland, he's the inventor. Mm -hmm. he's, the, he's the one that originally in 1999 invented the zirconia implant. Um, I think his are the best. There are some others out there that dentists have had good luck with as well. Um, all of them are better than, than mercury, but there are some that are better than others. Uh, are there changes to jaw shape and functionality after the cavitation surgery? No, except in a very rare situation because, um, you know, look at that picture again on the cavitations. Um, because this nerve is right there. And oftentimes the cavitation will actually have gone around the nerve and down into the jawbone. And a lot of times this nerve is exposed. There can on a rare occasion be some numbness left over from nerve damage. And so it's like you're waking up from an anesthetic where the lips kind of tingly. That's usually what it's like. Um, now I've never had one be permanent. They usually go away in a few weeks. The longest I've had was about three months. The biostimulation with the laser usually will bring it back. I've had patients that have had nerve damage 10 years ago. We do the biostimulation several times with this laser and they get 70 to 80% of their feeling back in this nerve that was previously dead. Um, so that's one of the biggest risks of, of the cavitation surgery. What is the alternative to root canal? There's a good question for you. Extraction and ceramic implant or a bridge or a removable partial denture. Um, those are generally the, 
the alternatives that we use kind of in that order. When you get the same reaction though, as a root Don't canal? The you do a titanium for sure. But if you're using the, the zirconia, it's totally neutral. Um, it doesn't have any reaction to the bone. <laughs> the meridian turned on. We've actually found that having the implant in the bone, you know, in the, in the older days, the older Hal Huggins and the original biological dentist here said all implants are bad. It's all a foreign body, even the zirconia. And there's quite a few biological dentists that, that still adhere to that. Mm -hmm. uh, the work that, that um, they've done in, in Switzerland with Dr. Klinghart, they've tested these extensively and found out that having the implant in the bone, stimulating the bone fibers when you chew, actually activates the meridian more effectively than not having anything there. Um, when you don't have something there also, the bone just disintegrates over time. So over a number of years, sometimes the teeth will move, you'll see resorption of the jawbone. So it maintains the, the strength and the dimensions of the jawbone and keeps the meridian more active is what the latest work is showing. Are tooth extractions in general a setup for chronic infections and inflammation? Yes, the vast majority of the time. You're kind of behind the eight ball to begin with. They're usually extracting it because it's infected um, or it's a root canal gone bad or something like that. So you've got a big load of bacteria in there to begin with. And if it's not cleaned out properly, most the, the teeth are held into the bone with ligaments that are like trampoline springs. And so as you chew, the teeth have a little bit of give to them. They give like the trampoline springs. Well, if those ligaments aren't completely removed from the bone, then the body still thinks there's supposed to be something in there. And then a lot of times doesn't fill in the bone completely or, or as well as it would. So removing all that old infected ligament, taking out a, a good layer of the bone around the tooth, then a good disinfection protocol. We like the laser and ozone um, and the silver now as, as well we're adding. If you know about tonsils and procaine, you might know about German neural therapy. Tonsils are big in arthritis. Yes, actually we had this old German guy taught us over there, I'm trying to remember his name. Mm. He's a, he does a lot of work with, um, oh, it's not MS, Lou Gehrig's disease, I think, um, something like that. But he is taught us neural therapy and showed doing the tonsil injections and all that. And I just, I have, better luck with the laser and it doesn't freak people out as much. But um, if you guys aren't doing tonsil injections with procaine and even procaine and ozone, I highly recommend you add that. That can really help your patients get well. If they don't heal is what he taught us over there. This guy's like in his eighties. Um, if they don't heal after procaine injections, then you need to look at taking them out. But in his experience in many, many years doing this, the vast majority heal and don't have to be removed. All right, now I got a question about gold in teeth. Is that, is that a problem? It is. Any metal in the mouth um, will block the meridian. Now, gold doesn't have the same toxicity that mercury does, but many, many times you've got a gold crown, it has an old mercury filling underneath. And those different metals touching each other creates a galvanic response that's like walking around with your tongue on a nine volt battery all the time. And that completely shorts out that meridian and blocks it like crazy. So better in the terms of not releasing the mercury, but the gold will usually cause the same issues that any metal in the mouth will. Okay. Is there a possibility of bone graft after amalgam ex extraction if there is no infection? Yes, and when, when we do extract the tooth, it should be grafted. Um, a lot of times we can just use platelet-rich fibrin. We have great luck growing bone with platelet-rich fibrin with these new protocols. However, most of the time in a tooth extraction and in the bigger cavitation surgeries, we do mix it with cadaver bone. So we cut it all up, we stir it all in with the cadaver bone. It's bigger than a centimeter. And it has a harder time doing and should be grafted with bone. They're not using cow bone. A lot of them are using cow bone for their grafts, and the cow bone never goes away. It's always cow bone. Is a jaw is a bone graft possible after the jaw bone infection is cleared? Yeah, yeah. That's what I say. We we do those quite regularly, especially the big ones. 
we add some some actual bone graft particles, um, some cadaver bone. Um, there are some synthetics that work if someone doesn't want to do the cadaver bone, but the gold standard is still cadaver bone. There is one company that does the bone harvesting that keeps about 4% of the bone. They have to show that it's osteoinductive. If their testing shows that it's osteoinductive, then they keep it. And the other 95%, they sell to all the other bone companies. Okay. Uh, and here's maybe the penultimate question. Does flossing really help? Now in Switzerland, they told us to throw away the floss. Um, take that for what it's worth. If you're flossing under the gums, like we always taught as dentists, that you curve it around the tooth, you get it under the gum pocket, um, you cut the gums, you allow that bacteria to get into the bloodstream, you're chronically breaking the connection of the gum to the tooth. Um, they said that's terrible. What they showed us is if you get their nutrition right, then the gums will heal up and the gum disease will completely go away without doing any flossing or even cleaning the tartar off their teeth. And, and so they said, throw away the floss. If you're prone to cavities in between the teeth, then floss in between the teeth, but don't go under the gums with it, if that makes sense. Yeah, every, time, every time I go get my teeth cleaned, I get scolded by the, by the, you know, the dental hygienist. It's, you know, it's like my, my twice a year, you know, uh, beating. <laughs> um, what about um, oil pull, or uh, you know, we have some people do uh, coconut oil and turmeric and uh, baking it soda. It won't do much for cavitations because that infection is so deep in the bone and it's so nasty. It can be really effective for gum infections, for mm -hmm. periodontal disease, that type of thing. All of that stuff has been really effective. Wheatgrass oil. Um, wheatgrass oil, they say you only have to rinse for five minutes. The oil pulling, you've got to do for like 20 minutes at a time, which is a long time. Um, and so you may look at that, but yes, all of those can be effective, but you can do the same rinses with silver. Now there's a homeopathic blend called Stella Life that again, only has cosmetic approval. Um, but that's what we're using right now in a lot of our post-op stuff. It's a mouthwash, a sublingual spray and a gel that you can paint right on the surgery sites. I believe we've seen just amazing healing with this Stella Life, it's called. Um, so Dr. Heidi's asking, how do we find people uh, in our area or wherever we live that does, does the type of biological dentistry that you do? Is there a registry somewhere? Yeah, the best way is to look on these websites. These are, are the main ones. Um, I'm most familiar with the IAOMT website. And if you go to that, you can. there's a list of dentists in your state that have at least been to a meeting or signed up with these guys. And so if you kind of use that to start your search, then you can find some and then you just ask the questions and see what kind of protocols they're doing and if they're using ozone and if they have a laser and those type of things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is there 3D printing of bone for a bone graft instead of cow bone? Uh, there is, yes, but not for the bone graft itself. Um, there's when we've got somebody that has like a dramatic bone loss, then we can print like a matrix um, with the 3D printing, put the bone graft inside that, stretch the gum so that it closes over the top, let that heal, and then take that out. And so we've started doing some of that with 3D printing to guide our bone grafts, um, but not, and, and you can use that to kind of shape the bone and then put it in. So in a way, yes. Um, but you can't print the bone itself. Okay, here's, a, here's another one of these um, monumental questions. Soft or medium brush? Soft always. Okay. Practice on teeth is very soft. It doesn't take anything to get it off. And so you should always use a soft toothbrush and I highly recommend a water pick versus floss. Um, Hydrofloss is a company that makes one that magnetizes the water. So it creates like a force field on the teeth that doesn't let the plaque stick as easy. It's about 70% more effective than the over-the-counter water pick. Um, that, that's what I recommend, but hard can damage the enamel and the, and the gums and you don't get much out of it. So use an electric toothbrush. All right, well, that was the next question. So you already got that one, right? Water pick or flosser? <laughs> uh, yeah, 
water pick, you'll brush, you'll floss, and then you use the water pick and you'll be shocked at what comes out every time. You think you did such a great job, you use that hydro floss or the water pick and you're getting all kinds of stuff out every time. Sort of like pressure washing the front yeah. front of the house, right? It's <laughs> just all those nooks and crannies that you can't get to with the brush and the floss. Right. Do you see any correlation with statin drugs and worse cavitations as they have a similar pathway to osteoporosis drugs? Um, yes, I, I believe, I haven't read through it all, but Dr. Lechner, I believe, has done some work on that as well, or, or someone in his immediate group over there. Um, I, I believe one of his papers or books does talk about that. So yeah, that, and as well as the, the bisphosphate osteonecrosis of the jaw, really, really similar to the way those work. Mm -hmm. um, do electric toothbrushes provide any benefit or do they make things worse? No, they're great. Most electric toothbrushes now actually have a setting that if you push too hard, like a hard toothbrush, then they shut off. And most of them don't spin like you think they do. If it's a good one, like an Oral-B or a Sonicare, they oscillate back and forth and in and out. And so you're kind of getting this 3D that actually sends waves through the teeth. And, but if you push hard, then a lot of that action stops. And, and so they can be really effective if you're a hard brusher. Okay. When you go for a cleaning, what should we ask the hygienist to know if they're using clean cleaning agents? Oh. Yeah, that's a good question. The, the big, big, big one that I got to mention, um, most dentists and hygienists, when they do deep cleans, periodontal surgeries, anything like that, um, scaling and root planing, those type of things, they're sending you home with a medicated mouthwash chlorhexidine. Um, it is one of the most toxic things there is to humans. It can cause major heart issues. Um, it, it, it should completely be a black box item and most dentists are still using it. So at, that's one of the best things to ask them is do they use chlorhexidine? Because if they're still using chlorhexidine, that's, that's a big red flag. All right. And if they use lasers, lasers are really important for periodontal surgery now or, or deep cleanings. And if they're up on any of those things or if they do um, DNA testing, a lot of hygienists now are starting to do bacteria testing in the mouth where they can get a bacteria panel of what's in your mouth. They can track it to see if you're having success in killing the pathogenic bacteria. Um, that type of thing can be good questions to ask. Okay. Uh, what kind of toothpaste do you recommend? That's a tough one because I got about a dozen up front um, and you can buy some great ones over the counter now. Anything that does not have fluoride that has a nanoparticle hydroxyapatite in it. Um, There's some really good ones. Uh, the Real Salt Company makes, makes a great one. Um, the, we like the doTERRA toothpaste. There's a, a dentist in, in um, New York, Dr. Curatola has one called Revitin that he claims doesn't kill the good bacteria. It only kills the bad bacteria. And so it, he says, instead of making the mouth a desert where you kill everything, that it's more like an organic garden. It only comes in orange flavor, and I'm not wild about orange flavor um, because mint is too strong and can affect the flora. Um, so those are some of the good ones that we use, but uh, there's quite a few good ones out there now. If the patient can't afford a root canal extraction, what can we what can we advise them? They can't afford the root canal or the extraction, doing ozone injections periodically for a while to buy them some time can be helpful or the laser biostimulation. Um, the oil pulling can help buy some time. Mud packs, um, doing like the bentonite clay, put it right over the, the tooth or the infected area, let it sit 10, 15 minutes, spit it out and go stand in the grass. Um, those type of things can be, can be really helpful to help buy you some time and dry out that infection. Mm -hmm. If you do have to put them on an antibiotic, which we do on occasion, it's always our last resort, but if we do have to put them on an antibiotic, some of these studies uh, from Varicil and these show that the antibiotics are much more effective if you're on the silver also. The silver mm -hmm. also can be protective for the gut flora. Mm -hmm. um, and so do we, whatever we do an antibiotic, we, we do the silver with it. Uh, well, Dr. Horvitz, I'm going to 
call you by name because you're the one who asked this. Are you ready? If I can't afford a tooth extraction, does a string tied around the tooth and connected to a door get that gets slammed, get, get the job done? I've seen that happen where patients have gum disease and they've lost some bone and I've seen them be able to do that. And um, make sure your doorknob is screwed on tight. <laughs> yeah, you can see it pull out the doorknob instead of the tooth, but <laughs> I don't recommend it. I don't see why not. <laughs> Uh, what concentration is the ozone injection solution? Uh, you know, it all depends on what we're doing and where we're at. Um, most of the ozone that I'm doing is right inside an open surgical site. And so I do the ozone gas straight out of the machine. So I run a pretty high concentration. Um, if we're doing injection, then we have to tone it down some. And, you know, I have it set on the machine. I don't even remember what it is. Sorry, I'm not that up on all the ozone stuff. I figured it out years ago and it's just never changed it. Great. Okay, that's all the questions that I have here. Um, I really like this, this string tied around the tooth. I like that one, I think. <laughs> that is fun. Do you recommend whiskey first? Uh, we got a lot, a lot of uh, appreciate you being with us. Thank you, well, thank you for sharing. Um, uh, um uh, one of our doctors says i guess i have to take my dental bling out now <laughs> so, <laughs> that's true um scott thank you for being with us again um well, and um so jim said i could i can lean on you every three to four months for uh for a little little pep talk yeah that's okay um thank you super insightful um excellent class great uh great talk um you got a, you got just about everybody here um, has given you a, you know a, a, a kudos and had a voice. Oh, thank you, Dr. Okay. Lecter's book is just fantastic. So I would highly recommend that all of his work. He's he loves to share. He's got a lot mm -hmm. of free papers out there that you can download and that type of thing. So great. He's a good resource. Okay, okay. Um, so again. Um, I'll send you the connections to Dr. Willoughby in Canada for the Veracil. Okay. Uh, and and send you this this PowerPoint so you you know got this this book mm -hmm. connection and all of that. And any other questions, just let me know. Uh, okay. So I got I got now lecture rating five teeth out of five. <laughs> <laughs> so I think they're getting a little punchy here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, um, Dr. Chandler, thank you so much again. Um, uh, it's always good to talk to you. And uh, it's always good for, you know, uh, it's something that most of us, you know, have, you know, you know, maybe a smattering of knowledge about. And um, um, if you could get us that, if you could send me that, those charts or a link to those charts or where I could find them, I'll send them out to, to our crowd here. Um, okay, um, so this will be up on our uh, website. Uh, like like always, aosrd.org. Where's where's that? There it is. Slash webinars. Aosrd.org slash webinars. Um, I'll have this up uh, usually within 48 hours. Uh, and uh, with all of the other lectures we have, you know, we've been doing this almost for two years now, and we have quite a quite a, a library of uh, of uh, uh, integrative medicine um, there for anybody you know any, any, and you know it's all free so if anybody you know needs anything um we have uh we have a, a great uh and and wide uh, range of uh topics um and if you're ever in park city come by and say hi watch a surgery okay um uh, we may take you up on that you never know <laughs> so um again um we finally got the videos for our, our, our March conference. Um, unfortunately, they're not separated. They're, they're separated by day, so they're quite long. I'm gonna see if I can either do it myself or find someone or somebody out there knows how to do it. Um, I'd like to separate them by lecture so that you know we, we, we don't, you don't have an eight hour video that you have to get through. Um, but they are there, they're all complete. Um, and uh, they are, um, uh, you know, there, there, anybody who was at the conference, um, I'm going to, it, it will be uh, posted on our, it actually is already posted on our, our website. Um, it's the AOSRD.org. Uh, 
previous uh, conferences and then it's Congress of Medical Excellence 4.0. And I'll send out again the um, password. Um, if you want to uh, part, if you want to uh, listen to the videos and they're we're still good, we can uh, grant you 26 CME credits once you fill out the uh, forms. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get you the forms that need to be filled out. Um, they don't take long, they take 10 minutes. Um, and if you want 26 CME credits, um, and we have credits for um, pain management, suicide prevention, and um, ethics, which are, you know, at least in the, out here in Western states, they're, they're state mandated every one to four years. Um, they're, they're always included. Um, and uh, John, are you still there? Are you here? Uh, any, any update on OMED? Yeah, I'm not only here, but uh, half of our OMED program in October will be focused on ethics. About the other half will be focused on PTSD, traumatic brain injury, and hormonal effects. So ethics is a big deal. And we also made contacts today with some other uh, investigative journalists, producers who deal with this kind of thing. And it was a very positive meeting. So what we have to do with ethics, um, I didn't know it was a mandatory thing. I knew about <laughs> it's. Um, it's. I think it's two hours out of two hours every four years, I believe. Wow. Well, we we are right in the center of the ethics. Um, yeah. Well, we we did two hours uh, in in um, in March. We had two hours. Um, we we had Sylvia, and then we had uh, Dr. Stock, um, and they, they both counted as as ethics. Um, there you and, go. Uh, um, okay. okay. And so, 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 you know, the, the, you're good to go for the year j just from that. Um, also, we had, uh, we always do suicide prevention and um, pain management. So, so we're, you know, most of the state requirements, at least in the Western states, are, you're already taken care of. Um, and it's AOA and AMA. So, you know, we're, we're, we're moving, we're moving along here. In case you didn't know, others you didn't hear, we were recredentialed for five years, which is the maximum um, uh, that, that the AOA will credential us, any, anybody for, not just us. Um, so we're, we're, we're in with the big boys, you know, the, the internal medicine, family practice people, um, they got nothing on us. So um, also, like, if anybody wants to go to Las Vegas in August, I would it's, it's a little warm, it's 114 at midnight, um, but uh, NOMA, Nevada Osteopathic Medical Association uh, is holding their summer conference at the Suncoast Hotel. And um, they've uh, given us a breakout room. So if we wanna present anything, um, we, uh, we, are, uh, we have uh, four hours we can present there also. So anybody wants to present anything, please let me know. Um, and um, we'll, um, we'll, we'll get that arranged also. Those of you who are kind of new at speaking or don't ever speak, um, th these are great um, ways to break in because there's you know not too many people around to throw tomatoes at you, and it's a good way to sort of, sort of practice. So, right, Dr. Chandler, you you, you only dodged a couple of them tonight, right? So, um, other than that, um, the AOA's House of Delegates is next month, and I haven't decided whether I'm going or not. Uh, I'm not sure I'm all that interested, but uh, uh, we'll uh, we'll 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 cross that bridge shortly. Anybody else have any questions, comments? That's like Dr. Gerber. Um, That's a question. Where? <clears throat> oh, Dr. Gerber. <clears throat> Unmute yourself. He's got a question here, so he's got a hand up anyway. Uh, ask to unmute. Okay, maybe it was an accident. I don't know. Maybe he's not there anymore. If you're there, Dr. Gerber, speak. Or that, or there you go. <laughs> okay. Um, well, um, we talk frequently. If, if it's something, uh, we'll, 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 we'll bring it up to the group next time. Okay, um, next week at the moment, I don't actually have a speaker. I, we may have Dr. James Joseph is going to uh, Am yeah. I getting you, Bill? Yeah, yeah, you're there. Go ahead. Quickie, uh, yeah. does he see uh, cavitations or infection around zirconium implants? 
Uh, not yet. I haven't, unless it was left behind when the zirconia was put in, um, is, is the only time. But the ones that we've done, that we've cleaned out, um, I've not yet, but I've only been doing them for 10 years. So it, I suppose it's possible. Thank you. You're welcome. Right, you have to be at the 20 year mark, right? To see one of those. Yep. Okay. Um, and with that, Anybody else? Um, comments, questions, uh, complaints? Um, if somebody wants to speak next week, I, I, I preliminarily have Dr. James Joseph. We're going to talk about interleukin six, which is you know you know the bad guy cytokine. Um, but I, I don't have that quite na nailed down yet. So if there is anybody else who has anything they'd like to present, um, let me know. Uh, the week after that, I have Dr. Halas is going to be speaking on. Um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, um, and um, uh, we'll take it, pick it up from there. So, Dr. Chandler, thank you again so much. Um, you can expect us to call on you again in a couple of months. <laughs> so, start preparing now. All right. This Thanks. is a tough crowd. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank again. Thank you so much for your time. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anybody right. else? Comments, questions, complaints. I'll see you next week, same time, same station. And uh, like I said, we'll have the vi this video up within 48 hours. Okay, good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night.